welcome to The English We Speak by Emma Kressler. This is our IHWO Low for April 2004. Yeah, just to remind you, the session is being recorded, so if you don't want to be recorded your um, excellent contributions in the chat box, then I'm afraid you'll have to leave now and watch the video on YouTube later, but please do stay with us. Uh, great to see you all here. We have some schools and, and people from all around the world. And I'm going to hand you over now to Emma for the workshop. Emma is the DOS at IH Santander. She started there this year, having been in Buenos Aires at the School in San Isidro for the last few years. And she's been talking regularly at our conferences uh, over the last couple of years. And of course, will be joining us in May for our next conference, and we hope you will too. So thank you all very much for coming. Many, many thanks to Emma for presenting today's workshop. And I shall hand you over to her now. Cool, thank you very much, Neil. Hi, everyone. Um, good afternoon. Welcome to Not So Sunny Spain. Um, today we're talking about the English we speak, which um, is looking at how the spelling and the pronunciation of English is linked and how, how that came about, basically. So just a quick run through. This is what we're going to be looking at today. Briefly looking at why I chose this talk. Then I'm going to be getting you guys in the hotspot, in the quiz seat, whatever you want to call it, before we look at the history of English and some rules, or so to speak rules, that we can use with our spelling and our pronunciation, looking in more detail a couple of extra things, and then finally looking at some ways we can bring this into the classroom, some activities that you can use with your students. So, to start with. Why I chose this talk, why I'm interested in this topic, um, as it says, there are two different doctors in two very different countries. The first one, Dr. David Hornsby, was um, one of my French professors at university. And it was in my final year of university, we were in a French translation course. And we were trying to figure out how to translate the word NESPA. And we couldn't come up with a translation into English that fitted the register and the style of the text. And he was like, okay, well, what is the direct translation of NISPA? And we were all a bit stuck. He goes, well, it's in it. And we were like, but how can we put in it in a formal text? And he then sort of talking about how NISPA, the register, had changed throughout, throughout its evolution in French language. And what originally started out as quite formal is now accepted all over the place, but it still maintains its formality at the same time. And I think that was probably one of the first times that I really thought about how languages evolve and how the meaning might not change, but the register may change through time. And it just, I mean, it got me thinking. But it was my kind of university, and I didn't really think much about it after that. Fast forward a few years, and there's a English language teaching conference that happens yearly in Buenos Aires. And I think it was my first year presenting there. But I went to a talk by the second guy, Dr. Andor Rebecca. He is a university professor from Lanús, which is just outside Buenos Aires. And he's really into etymology and linguistics. And he gave a speak, uh, a presentation, a session, looking at some of the things we're going to look at today, how English is made up of these rules which we, we might not know about, but linked to the pronunciation and the spelling. And I really had never thought about it in terms of the English language. I mean, I knew there were rules for Spanish, there were rules for French to an extent, but I didn't really know that it existed for English. So, in a way, it did open my eyes to it. You know, I hadn't expected it, I hadn't thought about it. And since then, I saw a couple of other talks, and we've been in email contact. And it, I mean, it opened up a different aspect of English to me that before I hadn't really considered. And one of the reasons, I mean, is because of the way English is made up. And we're going to look at that in a little while. But to begin with, over to you guys. I'm going to be asking you five different questions, uh, all multiple choice. I would just like you to write the answers in the chat box, because it's going to jumping ahead. But when the Romans arrived, who did they find living in the British Isles? A, the Celts, B, the Vikings, or C, the Anglo-Saxons? What do you guys think? Okay, everyone's going for A. 
Let's see if my computer will let me. Yes, it is this Alex. The Romanization began roughly 43 AD. The Anglo-Saxons didn't arrive until the 5th century, which is when the Roman power was beginning to reign, so to speak. And the Vikings then began to invade the north of the British Isles in the 9th century. Question number two is, the original name for the British Isles, Britannia, was used by which ancient culture? A, the Romans, B, the Greeks, or C, the Egyptians? Over to you guys. Okay, Tim's going for the Greeks. Okay, so again, everyone's going for Greeks. And that is correct. There's no real consensus over where this came from, but um, historians mainly believe that the Greeks used the word which was in using the Celtic language, which was then the predominant language in the British Isles. And the P became a B in the time of Caesar. Next question. The British Isles have an official name in how many regional languages or dialects? Three, five, and six. Over to you guys. Okay, Tim's gone for C, C six. Did you just gone for five? Okay. Five, five. Okay, so the consensus here seems to be five. Actually, Tim's in a roll at the moment. It is six, and they are the six. English, we call it the British Isles. Then you have Norman, Irish, Manx, Scottish Gaelic, and Welsh. So of the different languages and dialects spoken in around the British Isles, these are the ones that have official, an official name for the British Isles. And I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce half of those. I could probably get away with Norman, but the rest of it, no. So, question four. In which originates from a fusion of languages and dialects that existed in the British Isles, which of the following is not believed to have formed part of this fusion? We have A, Old English, B, Old Goodnish, and C, Old Norse. Over to you guys. Okay, Georgina and Tim are going for B. Okay, so again, we have a consensus on B. Let's see what Lee's going to put. Okay. Yeah, you guys are right. Old Goodnish. Um, basically, Old English is a West Germanic language. I didn't make Old Goodnish up, actually. West Germanic language is Old English, and that originates from the anglo frisian dialects, which were brought to British Isles by the Germanic invaders. Old Norse is a North German language, brought to England by Norsemen who then settled in the northeast of England. And Old Goodnish is an Old Norse dialect which was spoken on the island of Gotland. So I didn't make it up, but I had no idea where Gotland is, so um, I think there are very few people who spoke it. Um, my last question to you is, amongst other things, English is characterized by the use of modal verbs and the division of verbs into weak and strong forms. This is typical of most Germanic languages, Latinate languages, and Nordic languages. What do you think? And hi, Dan. Okay, Germanic, gone for. Okay, again, you guys are all right. They are Germanic languages. And actually, we still do have, if you can think of languages in terms of being related, the closest living relative to the original English language is actually the dialect of Frisian languages, which is spoken in and around Netherlands, Denmark, and Germany. And they all share this same characterization. So, I'm going to let you guys rest your brains a little bit. What do you think of quest answering questions? And we're moving on to the origins of the English language. The English we speak today, it's a result of many things. Invasions, colonization, globalization. Invasions in terms of different countries, different powers invading the British Isles. I mean, that hasn't happened for quite a few years, but the ones which did invade us way back before 1066, 
They left a very strong influence in the language we speak today, which we'll be looking at in a little while. You also have colonization, where Great Britain and the United Kingdom went over and colonized different parts of the world. And apart from bringing back slaves and food and all sorts, we actually brought back some of their language with us. And it's all become part of the language we speak today. And then globalization. English is all over the world. You have TV, internet, etc. It all has also changed the English we speak. Um, there's actually a video by the British Council which summarizes the history of the English language in 10 minutes, which you can find on YouTube. Um, it's worth a watch. It's only 10 minutes, and it's a very funny little cartoon, but it explains the history of the English language better than I ever could. So check it out if you get the chance. In terms of the origins of the English language, there's not a lot of consensus. Different historians have argued about it, and they probably will carry on. It's, I mean, English has a history of fusing and adopting words from different cultures and countries. And if you look at the first of the tables, the one on the left, this looks at um, the source of the most frequent 7,476 English words. I don't know where they got that number from. And the majority are Germanic, at least in the first hundred words. But in theory, the majority of the words are of Germanic origin. Yet if you look at the pie chart on the right, it's much more even, and you've got Germanic, Latin, and French all having like quite an equal share. So it depends what words you're looking at, it depends what sources you're looking at. Basically, English has a very mixed background, and this is what we're going to look at now. Here, you have eight different words. Some of them are higher frequency words in this language, others aren't. And I'd like you to try and match them to their origins. You've got the origins underneath. Um, Arabic, Dutch or Low German, French, Greek, Indian, Malay, Old Norse, and Persian. I would like you to match the word to their origin, please. You can just write it in the chat box. Okay, pajamas Indian, alcohol, Arabic. A few people have done for that. Okay. Admiral French. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've got a little bit of debate going on. Character Greek, Greece is Dutch or German. Okay. Um, some of them you've got, some of them not so much. These are the answers. Admiral is actually Arabic. Alcohol comes from Persian. Though I think I'm right in saying that the Arabic languages do take a lot of like we're influenced quite a lot by the original Persian, so that's probably where those do come from. Amok is Malay, Greece, Dutch or Low German, character is Greek. Competition French, mistake old Norse, and pajamas Indian. Like I said, some of these were some of these words aren't like a lot higher frequent words, high, high frequency words than others. But it's interesting. I think for me it's interesting to know where some of the words come from. And especially pajamas is in that video I was telling you guys about. So there you go. Moving on. We get to ten sixty six. Ten sixty six, the Battle of Hastings, the Norman Conquest. Call it what you want. It basically it introduced a very big class divide into the into England, into the British country, whatever you want to call it. And there's a class divide and there's a linguistic divide. In 1066, with the French or the Norman Conquest, they brought a new language to the British Isles, the language called Longwy. This was a language which was spoken in northern and central France, Belgium and Switzerland. It was now also spoken in the British Isles. But not by everyone. Mainly the Norman kings, who were the ruling class, and the nobility. They were the only people who actually spoke Longwy. The rest of the British, British people, the lower classes, so to speak, they stuck to Old English, which meant you had two languages being spoken simultaneously in the British Isles, which meant that the influence of the Norman language was mainly restricted to the courts and the government, as well as the nobility. 
This led us to Middle English. Middle English is the closest to what we speak today, and it has a strong influence on the Norman. It was when the class divide became really less big, so to speak, and you had more of a mix in, and there's a mix of Old English and Anglo Norman, but also Latin, because Latin was still spoken in the clergy and in the churches. So you had these three languages existing simultaneously in the British Isles. And it's a synonymy, I can say the word synonymy, which still exists today. For example, there we have the words regal, royal, and kingly. All mean, or all have a similar meaning, but they have very different origins, Latin, French, and Old English. The having three words isn't as common, but you will find that we have lots of words which have both an Old English and an Anglo-Norman influence, but for the same thing, what well, similar thing. We call pig the animal, but pork is the meat. And all of the words on the left column are the Old English words, and all of the words in the right column are the Anglo-Norman words. And it's a question I get asked fairly often by my students, is, you know, why do we have one word for the animal and another word for the meat we eat? And this is why. Because we have the two languages existing simultaneously in the British Isles, and it resulted in two different words. Again, some of them are more commonly used than others, like freedom and liberty, slightly different. But things like pig and pork, cow and beef, it's part of our everyday vocabulary. And this kind of thing, it's a kind of thing, students will ask us questions, you know, why does this mean the same but you have two words? And really the reason goes back to 1066, so it goes back quite a few years. So what we're going to do, actually before we go into that, no, we're not, we're going to go into it right now. We're going to look at some other pairs. These are words that have one pair, one pair, one word in the pair is Germanic, and one word is Latin. And I would like you guys to tell me which word do you think has a Germanic origin, and which word do you think has the Latin origin. So, we have relinquish and abandon. Which word do you think is Latin, which do you think is Germanic? Okay, abandoned in Latin and English in German. Okay, I can actually say it's the complete opposite. Abandoned has a Germanic origin and relinquish has the Latin origin. And we'll look at the reasons why in just a minute. The next pair I would like you to look at is pain and ache which has the Germanic, therefore Old English origin, and which has the Latinate, therefore Anglo-Norman origin. Word of warning, don't go for any Spanish or Italian influences, because you probably will find out that it's actually the complete opposite. Okay, ache Germanic. Pain Latin. Let's see. Okay, again, I think the majority are correct because ache is Germanic and pain is from the Latin. Next pair, anger and rage. Okay, Tim says rage is Latin. Lee says rage is Germanic. Interesting. Okay. Yep, I can tell you anger is Germanic and rage is Latin. So again, I think half of you were right, half of you were on the other side. Our next pair, manner and etiquette. Which one do you think is of Germanic origin and which is of Latin origin? Okay. Okay. <laughs> the Virginia City Main event for the 50-50. Um, 
I can tell you that etiquette is of Germanic origin and manner is of Latin origin. So that one I think is quite a tricky one. And the last one, in vogue and elegant. Which one's which? Okay, fans going for elegant to be Latin, as is Tim. <laughs> okay, so yeah, I think this one you have got correct because in vogue is German or Germanic, and Latin is the one that goes elegant. So if we look here, we can actually look at the origins and the origins as in what dialect do they come from and how they enter the English language. And most, I mean, I'm not expecting you to know this off the top of your head, but most websites, most dictionary websites will give you some kind of etymology explanation as to where the language came from. And at the end of the presentation, I've got some websites which give you even more detail if you really are that interested, depending on how much you want to know for your classes. So that brings us to Middle English. Middle English was pretty much around the late Middle Ages between the I guess 10 to 14th century, there or thereabouts. And amongst that time, we had a monk in Lincolnshire called Orm in the 12th century. And I don't think it's too strong to say, in a way, he revolutionized the English language. He was asked to write a biblical exegesis, which is like a critical commentary of the Bible. And being a very humble monk, he called it Ormium, which means written by Orm. But when he was writing it, one of the things he was worried about was that the fact the majority of the clergy couldn't actually read, and he was worried that what they were preaching to their congregation wasn't what was written in the Bible. So he developed an, like an idiosyncratic spelling system to make it easier so they would know that if it was written this way, you said it this way, therefore everyone would understand. Um, there's actually only one copy left in the whole entire world of this of this text, which is in all the libraries in Oxford, and um, people have studied it for years and years and years. And what we're going to do now is look at some of these spelling rules that he came up with to help with the pronunciation. One of the things he is credited for is actually introducing these soft J sounds into the English language. Before before Orm came along, apparently there's only the hard G sound, and he differentiated between G and J. That's one thing which isn't really a rule, it's just an extra bit of piece of information. So we're going to look at 14, 14 or thereabout rules, and we're going to look at like, some of the implications this has for our classroom. Starting with double consonants. Double consonants are used to show that the preceding vowel is a short vowel, and therefore it doesn't glide. For example, common, you have the R, but local, you have the O and things like little with a double T and title with a single T. One thing to point out, double consonant as in the same consonant, because you see there in title, T and L are both consonants, but it's not a double T like in little. Can you think of any other pairs of words or any other words where this comes into play? It's definitely useful for Spanish speakers, yeah, things like written and hidden. Like Bubble and Michael Goodler, most definitely. Pate and Patrick. So there's lots of them. So these things, I think they are quite common. You just haven't maybe thought about them before. Another thing he introduced is to show the difference between certain homonyms. He introduced, or he decided to put the letter W or K before the original, or before the first consonant. For example, write as in the writer passage, and then write as in write your name or night is in night time, and night is in night in shining armor. So again, it's just, it's more, I guess, when you're writing, so you know exactly which one, like most of their knit and knit. Can you think of any other ones? I'm sure there are lots, but just other homonyms that you can differentiate with. Yeah, write and write, there's lots of them. So, and it's when you're writing more than anything that these really are useful. 
Another rule he introduced um, was adding an E at the end of a word, which lengthens the sound and produces the glide. For example, cake and make. Um, I have to say this because Jessica is in the other room, but apparently in some primary schools in England, they refer to this as the magic E because it changes the sound of the word. And it's just useful. It's just useful to know that if you have the vowel consonant E, it's a magic E. And it doesn't matter what it it's a magic E. Another thing he introduced was that words that have the stress on the last simple syllable, you double the final consonant when you're fixing it. Therefore, refer becomes referred. Kidnap becomes kidnapping. Can you think of any other any other words which double the last syllable when you're fixing? Yeah, there we go, occur and occurred. Cool. Similar, but not quite. Um, words that end in al, el, il, ol, ol, double the l when it fix in, regardless of where the accent falls. Many so you can keep the short vowel sound, like cancel, cancelled. However, I think this is actually different in US English. So in US English, you can spell things like cancelled and traveling with one l. So it depends on what type of English you speak, I guess. I don't want to know where that came up, Neil. Um, you can also apply this rule to prefixes if you want to keep the short vowel sound in the prefix. For example, prove and approve, not approve. Apply and okay, there's this type that actually say apply, not approve, approve. So. Yeah, beautiful, beautifully. So we've got lots of them there. Monosyllabic words have quite a few different rules. If it's written with a single vowel, it can't end in a single S, F, L, or Z. Hence, miss, cliff, kill, and jazz. However, there are some exceptions, which are all Old Saxon words. For example, this, as, his, pal, if, and nil. They all can end in one of the single consonants. Another one. If the monosyllabic word is written with a single vowel, it cannot end in a single C, but has to be CK. Luck, sick, and pick, for example. However, if it's written with a double vowel, you only need to use the K. For example, look, leak, and meek. And moving on to number eight. The spelling EA, generally English has two different ways of pronunciation. The E as in heat and the E as in head. Exception is great big steak, which is the A. And the head is actually supposedly because it was Saturn's forehead was assimilated to head and that's how the sound changed was how the sound stayed as it was. Other ones, these are slightly more common I think. PH becomes F physics, philosopher, and I'm sure you can think of lots and lots of other PH words that we pronounce as a th, not a PH. And 10, if you have DGE, you only have one vowel preceding it. For example, bridge and bridge and edge and lots of others. And this is very similar to TCH, which again can only have a single vowel. And then we have in Words such as our, honest, air, and honor, it's a mute H, so we don't say hour or honest, but our and honest. And then we come to TH. TH has lots of different rules because it depends on the origin of the word. For example, if it's a Greek word and it's in the middle, it's the th. For example, method, mathematics. And can you think of any others? where the th is a th in the middle of a word. Mythical? Good, I like that one. This is Spain, okay. Good, we have lots of them. It also has a th sound if it's at the end of words, for example, month and moth, and I guess we could use pith there as well, and myth. So, yeah, lots of them. Path, good. If it's at the beginning of a Germanic word, it is also th, for example, think and thank 
um, thought, I don't know if thought's Germanic, but yeah, the beginning of the word. However, if it's at the beginning of a Saxon word, then it's the the, for example, this and there and the. And can you think of any others? Any other words that begin with a the as opposed to a th? Them, yeah. The, good. And the last one, if it's in the middle of a Germanic word, then it's a the. So father, mother, brother. So here the origin really does come into play. That's true that they're all grammar words. Maybe we got our grammar from Saxon. I don't know. I'm not too sure where our pronouns come from. And then we have T-H-E. We already said that if the word ends T-H, it's a th, but if it ends T-H-E, then it's a the. For example, clothe and cloth, bathe and bath. However, we have our friends Thomas and Esther, who live by the Thames. Yes, these are proper nouns and names, so there's given slight leeway. But in general, those rules do work. It's very much linked to word origin, but it, it can help explain why we have the same letters in the middle of the word, but pronounced very differently. And sticking with word origin, I have a question for you. And that question is, why do we say character, but charity? They're both CHs, but why is one cut and one ch? Lots of French influence. Yeah, Greek, I think you got it. I mean, you hit it now right on the head. It's the word origin. Character, as we saw earlier on in the presentation, comes from Greek. And it begins with the Greek key or chi, depending on how you pronounce it. And charity was originally Latin and came to English through French, like Hannah said, which was the charité, which in English became ch, charity. So, adding to the rules we've just looked at, word origin does affect the pronunciation. And the CH, I know in Spanish it causes quite a few issues because they want to pronounce it like a K, but they think they have to pronounce it like a CH because they've been told that lots of English CHs are CHs. So, if you can explain to them, you know, yes, it is a CH sound sometimes, but sometimes it's a K sound because of the origin. It helps. It goes a little way to understanding why we have these differences in our pronunciation. And I have another question for you now, which is, what is a cluster? Okay, two more consonants together. Consonants which are separated by vowels. Groups of consonants together. Okay. <laughs> what they said. Yeah, what they said basically. Um, according to the dictionary, a consonant, oh, sorry, a cluster is a succession of two or more contiguous consonants in an utterance, such as the STR in strap. However, as Nils just asked, um, you can have vowel clusters as well. I mean, technically the definition is for consonant, but vowel clusters also exist. Um, vowel clusters came into English during Middle English, which you can call a vowel cluster a diphthong if you're looking at it from the pronunciation. However, vowel clusters do exist when you have two or three vowels together. And you also have, which is what we're going to look at in a minute, when you have both the vowels and consonants together to make a special type of cluster, which doesn't have a name, it's just a special type of cluster as far as I'm concerned. And one of the most problematic clusters in the English language is O-U-G-H. 
O-E-G-H originated and originates from Middle English, where it's probably pronounced ux, but we don't really know. It has at least six different pronunciations in US English, and over ten in British English, depending on, I think, regionally, sometimes it's pronounced quite differently. And here are just a few words that have the O-U-G-H cluster in them. And I know we don't have the phonemic scripts in the chat box, but I would like you to try and phonemically or phonetically spell some of these words so we can look at the pronunciation. OK, we've got tough, the first one. Cough. OK, so we've got ow and o, trough. OK, plow. Thought. Good, we're getting quite a few of them. Slow and slough. Rude. Okay. Borough, yep. Pickup, yes. Hi, Johnny. Trust you to find the phonetic script. Borough, good. Owl, which one's owl? Okay, so I'll uh, get it. Pick up. Good. So if you look at the phonetic script, um, yeah, we have tough, cough, trough, or apparently in some US states it's trough. I don't know if we have any US speakers who can confirm that. Plow, dough, thought, through, burrow, hiccup, lock, or locked, um, left for and then the last one, we can have slough, slough, or slough, sorry, slough, slough, or slough, depending on what it is. And there's another quite problematic cluster in English language, which is the OMB word. For example, you can have two, T-O-M-B, you can have bomb, B-O-M-B, um, you can have samba, S-O-M-B-R-E, and the other one I can't remember is comb, C O M B. Thank you. <laughs> is slough off, slough off an insult? I think it is an insult. I'm going to start using it with some of my students, maybe. Um, can you think of any other problematic clusters that we have in the English language? Yeah, I and B, we've got a few of those. SPS, what do you mean by SPS, Georgina? Crisps, okay, yeah. I know the French people in particular have, have problems with crisps. Okay, so now we kind of looked at the theory part of this presentation. And what we need to look at now is how can we apply these rules and this knowledge to our class? Because I'm guessing if we just go into class and say that this rule exists and this rule exists, we will lose our students in about 30 seconds. So we need to look at games and stuff that we can introduce and we can use in class to reinforce some of these rules or just to practice them. And starting with spelling. One way you can do it is with a spelling relay. You get your students in groups. I quite like it when you've got them sitting in rows like one chair behind each other or standing one behind each other so they can't actually see. And basically, you say a word and they have to spell them, spell the word in their groups, but only one student can write at a time. For example, you say the word potato and hopefully the first person in each group will write P and then pass the paper behind them or to the person next to them. The second person has a choice. He can either, either write the second letter, or if he thinks the first person in their group has spelled it incorrectly, he can change what the person before them put. However, if they change the word, the letter given to them by the previous person, they then can't add anything to it. And the winner, the winning team, is the team which spells the word correctly the quickest. And it, I mean, it works on both like group scales and it works on different levels. And 
I've, I've had good fun with it. It works quite well. Another game you can play is Battleships. I think most people are familiar with Battleships. And there's different ways to do it. Basically, the students have a grid, and they write different words on that grid, and they have to then guess their partner's words by choosing squares. You can use letters, you can use phonemes, depending what you want to practice, if you want to practice the sounds, or if you want to practice the spelling. And it can be done in pairs, it can be done in groups. And if you do want to be on a pronunciation route, the book Pronunciation Games by Mark Hancock actually has a more detailed version of this, where the coordinates are actually different phonemes. And by choosing a coordinate, you're spelling out a particular word. So that's more if you go on a pronunciation route. But it's a very good game to play, so I would recommend it. But what we're going to do is we're going to have a little game of battleships. So here's my grid. I have got four words in this grid, um, both with letters and with phonemes. And I would like you guys to give me some coordinates and we can start guessing the words that I've got in my grid. No, we didn't erase our board. OK. B4. Let's see if I can get B4. B4 is, actually nothing is in B4. Any other coordinates? Three D. Yeah, three D. You can actually see what we did in the previous session, but I can add to that. Three D is an E. E one we have there is K. Can you get any of the other words? Any other coordinates you want to throw at me? Nothing? We're still missing a few words, so you can easily get some other squares. 3E. Yeah, that was quite an easy one. And again, we have the K. So you can see that perhaps in the K we have seek. A5. Nothing in A5, Fran. So we can cross that one off. D4. Yeah, D4 we have the L. D2 we have F. I should say that that's a completely different word. D5, yes, we have that. So there you go. I mean, you can see how the game plays, how the game goes. You just choose the square, and again, you can either say the phoneme sound, or you can go for the actual letter. But it's good fun, and then you can have the grid as big as you like, you can have it as small as you like, you can have a minimum amount of words, a maximum amount of words. And the students usually get quite into it, so I enjoy it as well. And this is the actual grid that I have, so the other word I had down the side was pick, P-I-C-K. Another game which gets the kids or the students out of their chairs and moving around is what, we, what I call, and I know it has other names in different parts of the world, which is jump the line, where you can div divide the board into two, and each half of the board represents a different sound or cluster or however you want to do it. And the teacher's at the front, and they say a word, and you've got the students in the middle of the classroom, and when you say the word, they have to jump to the corresponding side, depending on what, what, you know, what sound you've got. For example, here, with the th and the th, I could say the word brother, for example, and they have to decide, is it a th sound or a th sound? It's great for minimal pairs. It's great for lots of things. I mean, I've done it with all sorts of things that like you can even do with irregular and regular verbs. But if you want to challenge your students a bit more and also give them a workout, you can give them a whole sentence. For example, I think on Tuesday someone came up with my brother from another mother, which is all the the, but they have to jump, jump, jump each time. Or you don't even have to say the word. You could write the word on the board or you could have it on a piece of card and hold it up. And that way they can't hear you say it, but they have to think in their head, how do we say that word? And they jump to the corresponding side. 
And to get them to practice, you can have one of them come to the front and say the word. And they can take it in turns that way. What I also try to do when I do this game is I rotate the order of the line because it could just be the people at the back always follow or the people in front do. So if you have it rotating, at some point each person will be at the front of the line and there's no one they can follow. So they really have to think on their feet, so to speak. Another game that I would like to look at is one called Cluster Buster, which is one that I've adapted from the Hancock book I told you about. And here, students have a grid um, with a starting point and an ending point. Or you can just have it on the board and they don't have to have their own grid. But basically, the grid is filled with clusters. And the students have to get from the beginning to the end by making words with these clusters. To make it more concrete, you could just give them the phonetic sound as opposed to the actual spelling. But they have to get, for example, here, they have to get from O-U-G-H to E-C-K. They can go whichever way they like. My only rule is, because everyone has to start in the same square, they will have to give a different word. So if you've got three groups or four groups, how many groups, they have to give a different word for each cluster. So, over to you guys. I would like you to get from O-U-G-H to E-C-K with different words contained in the clusters, please. Okay, Tim's going for bar, cough. Okay, so Fran's going for cough and lice. Hawk, okay. Okay. True, nice clock sec. Okay. So we've gone from one side to the other. If you've got stronger groups or you just want to challenge your students, once they've given you the words, you can do what Neil's done there, I think. Neil's gone a different way. And you can actually get them to form sentences with the words they've chosen. For example, Lee had through mice, clock, and feck. I would then say to him, okay, give me a sentence using all those words. And that then makes them think a little bit more. Um, so over to you guys. This time I would like sentences that contain all the different words and their corresponding clusters, please. Sounds like the other tip. You can sound very strange when you're making up these sentences. If I can also be through the clock again. Yes, that would work. You've slightly gone a different way Slightly change the order of your clusters a little bit, but yeah. Slow's nice rock beckons. Yep. I don't think you get rock in slow, but I'll take your word for it. Nothing is nice and slow. Not even their rock. The tart walked past the two and thought she was too thin. And um, you've gone slightly off order there, but yeah, they were all legitimate words. Okay, so you see the idea there, and again, you can have the grid as big as you like or as small as you like, and like I said, you can have actual phonetic sounds, or you can have the clusters themselves. And another way to do it is to get the students to make it themselves. They make their, their grids, and they choose their clusters, and they can challenge their classmates just to get them thinking a little bit more. Um, so... Even though we've been going through all these different rules and looking at ways to help our students to understand that if you have this spelling, it says this. If you have this, it has that. Um, there's a poem I'd like to share with you, which just basically goes to prove that the English language is very, very, very varied and has random spelling rules. And 
I actually, I found this poem a few years back, and then when I was planning a class on Monday for proficiency level, they actually have this same poem as a gap fill in objective proficiency, the new version. So I think even for my prof students, it would be a very challenging poem. But this is a poem, and I'm going to attempt to read it to you. However, it is quite difficult, and I usually do stumble a few times. So, I take it you already know of tough and bar and cough and dough. Others may stumble, but not you, and hiccup thorough, slew and through. Well done, and now you wish, perhaps, to learn of less familiar tracks. Beware of heard, a dreadful word, that looks like beard and sounds like bird. And dead, it's said like bed, not bead. For goodness sake, don't call it deed. Watch out for meat and great and threat. They rang with sweet and straight and debt. A moth is neither moth and mother, nor both and brother, broth or brother. And here is not a match for bear, nor deer and fear for bear and pear. And then there's does and rose and lose. Just look them up and goose and choose, and cork and work, and card and ward, and front and front, and word and sword, and do and go, and thwart and, thwart and cart. Come, I've hardly made a start. A dreadful language, man alive. I'd learned to speak it when I was five, and yet to write it, the more I sigh, I'll not learn how to the day I die. So that, to me, sums up the English language. It's a mixture of so many different sounds and origins and all sorts. And I challenge you to try and read that poem out loud in front of your class and see if you can actually do it. Because even in front of the mirror, it's still challenging enough. So just before we finish, I've got some links for you guys. The first one is actually the blog of the guy in future at the beginning, Dr. Rekka. He has his own blog, which he uploads his, his talks to, like his workshop sessions. It's kind of a bit of an English and in Spanish, because he goes in between the two. But it looks in a lot more detail at some of the things we saw today, as well as looking at things like phrasal verbs and why we use particular particles with particular verbs. And if you do wish to read more about Orm, and I can't think why you wouldn't, because I think he's a great guy. Um, this is a Swedish project, and they've spent the last 20 odd years studying him and actually reading the reading the manuscript in great detail to look at all the different, basically to look at everything that he brought in his language. And they also look at it from a re religious aspect as well. So you've got the two bits going on there. And in terms of etymology, um, these are some different websites. The first two web sense of our etymology dictionary, they are basically dictionaries, but as well as giving the meaning, they give you the origin. And you can kind of search within it. For example, if you type in one word, it tells you the root and the language, and you can then go further in by looking at that root and that language. And you, I mean, I can lose hours in there. So the other three are more magazine-style websites, which are created by the general public. And some of them, they have like word of the day, or they have they look at different aspects. I know that's my Friday night sorted as well. So I mean, they're very good. And if you do ever have you know a doubt about where does this word come from, these are the places to go. So thank you, thank you very much. That is what I would like to share with you today, and hopefully you got something interesting out of it. Great stuff. Thank you very much, Emma. Uh, Thanks, join me in a big round of applause. So, Emma, they're really interesting stuff, fascinating view of the English language, and there's some great ways of taking it into the classroom with you. Um, and so that'd be our uh, for April. Thank you all very much for coming along. I hope you had a great time. Let me just stop the recording.